episode of the Good Ram Show with me, Chris Goodram. Okay, um, so as per usual, uh, a big thank you to everybody uh, that watched last week's episode of the show and commented. Um, certainly, I, I enjoy reading your comments, and like I said, I do try and uh, and reply to them uh, as soon as uh, is is possible. Um, so yes, yeah, a really big thank you. Like I said, without you guys watching the show, without your support. Um, obviously, <laughs> there'd be no point in doing it. I'd be may as well be talking to myself. Um, anyway, um, for those of you that live in the UK, obviously you know that last weekend was a bank holiday weekend, which gave me the opportunity to do some box digging. Um, I cleared uh, three sort of fairly you know, sizable boxes out of the cupboard below the stairs, which were rammed full of uh, half uh, half toasted samples. Um, there was a, a number of um, that, they were pretty much all from competitions, what generally the World Spirits Awards and stuff like that. And there was there was one box full of um, samples for the, that I tasted for the whiskey magazine when I was doing their new releases tasting. So um, I've now got about twenty odd episodes the show lined up and I've got little groups of bottles you want to see down here I've got several groups of bottles down here I've got bottles over there there's bottles over there um, there's bottles everywhere in actual fact little groups of them and um, I was going oh wow look I've got that I'd forgotten about that one and wow you know um, and it's it, this has kind of given me an opportunity to to look at a few things that ordinarily I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do so and today's episode of the show is one of those uh, opportunities I guess um, we're looking at an independent bottling company called Single Malts of Scotland. Now, Single Malts of Scotland was a brand that was created by a company called Speciality Drinks, I think in about 2005. And the interesting thing is I do have regular dealings with Speciality Drinks, uh, although they've never really sent me samples of, uh, of uh, the, the Single Malts of Scotland range. And to be fair, I've never really asked. So, uh, I tend to sort of... Um, to, get things from them that ordinarily I, I wouldn't be able to get hold of because it, you know, distilleries and what have you that I don't have any direct dealings with so so you could kind of say that they're, they're sort of a uh, wholesaler I suppose and um, uh, like I said I've never really sort of asked them for, for, for samples of the uh, single malt of Scotland range but uh, anyway so here I have I've got five now uh, it's a bit of an archive tasting because these uh, were originally tasted I think for the whiskey magazine back in July of 2014 so uh, um, I imagine these bottles are no longer uh, available um, although you might find them on the secondary market and auction sites and things like that but uh, um, I don't believe that they're available so apologies if any of them sound absolutely stunning and you really think oh, I ought to have that bottle sorry um, it's just I find it's just nice to do something a bit different and you know look at a, a different uh, independent company and um, well you know that's 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 life isn't it so anyway uh let's uh well, let's just take a look at uh, what i've got lined up right okay so i think i've got a fair few interesting uh interesting bottlings in front of me the first uh bottling we're gonna look at is an 18 year old klein ellish don't see a great deal of klein ellish about nowadays uh, certainly not in uh, uh, bourbon cask which this one is um i don't know whether it was a hoggy or uh, a barrel but uh, um it's an 18 year old uh, distilled in 1995 bottled in 2014 uh at 57.5 percent and the cask reference number is 10193 so yeah, that'd be a nice one to start off with i think and uh, the bottling number two we're going to be looking at is a ooh, Glen Rothes. Mm. And not a sherried Glen Rothes either. Ooh. Ooh, so there'll be no masking that distillery character with a bit of sherry. Um, anyway, <laughs> this is, so this was distilled in 1990, again bottled in 2014. 49.4%. Uh, 20, like I said, 23 years old. A single bourbon barrel, reference number 35. 
Uh, bottling 3 we're going to be looking at, again it's one you don't see very often these days, it's a long morn, uh, it's 21 years old, it was distilled in 1992, again bottled in 2014 at 49.7% and uh, again a bourbon cask, don't know what type, uh, reference number 110979. Nice to see some relatively low ABVs at uh, a, a sort of a good age, I seem to have been tasting quite a fair few oldish malts that have you know ridiculously high ABV so it's nice to see a few that have more should we say a more sensible uh, ABV for their age. Bottling number four again is one you just really don't see very often these days this is a Glen Grant uh, a 22 year old Glen Grant um, distilled in 1992 again bottled in 2014 uh, a sing uh, again, a, a bourbon cask with some form or description, uh, reference number 35936, and again bottled at 57.8%. So again, looking forward to that one. And finally, we're not going to end on a bit of peat, but we're going to bit of end with a Tobermory. <gasps> Oh yes, a sharp intake of breath there, and a sherry Tobermory as well. Even sharper intake of breath. Um, Yes, it's a 19-year-old Tobermory, distilled in 1994, again bottled in 2014. Um, don't know whether it was a butt or a hoggy, uh, but the cask reference number was 5174, and it was bottled at 55.8%, so leaving the interesting one to the end. Anyway, so... To be honest with you, I think a really interesting array of different distilleries, different styles, um, so... Yeah, let's kick off with a bit of Klein Ellis. It's only a matter of time can stop me right, okay, so again. let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Quite an alcohol prickle to start off with. Um, it's oily, it's grainy, oxidised fruit, straw, damp earth, wheat flakes, I'm getting quite a lot of of, of, of American oak character or bourbon -y character, it's got a wheat flakes and rye, you know, that sort of herbally kind of rye character. Um, I'm not getting a huge amount of distillery character, it has to be said. Um, I'm not getting any real sort of waxy, oily kind of fruit. Yes, there's a little bit of oiliness here. Um, there's some maturity, obviously, like I said, I'm getting that sort of oxidized. Um, fruit kind of character. It's a little bit of honey. Um, I mean it's a pleasant enough nose but I'm feeling that the oak is a little dominating at the moment. Certainly neat. Um, and I can't imagine this was particularly cheap even even though this, is five, this was five years ago. Um, anyway let's see what the part's like. Again, a lot of oak, a lot of alcohol. Again, it seems quite mature. I'm getting a lot of oxidised, um, oxidised apple, maybe apricot, a little bit of honey. It's got a, a slight sort of waxiness, a slight oiliness, a um, bit of straw, uh, fairly masked finish, maybe a little bit of spice. Um, but really, it's kind of pretty much oak and alcohol um, so let's put a little drop of water with it and uh, see what that does to it hopefully it might actually bring out some character and knock back the oak but we shall see it certainly brought out the natural oils so you could argue yes it's brought out some distillery character but it's kind of the oils have come out to the extent where the nose is a little bit flat and a little bit muted. Um, there's a bit of honey now, still, there's a, a herbal notes, but... And maybe you could argue the oak is a little bit more creamy, but it's kind of lost some of that, um, that verve, I guess. Um, 
again, I mean, it, it's not a bad whiskey, but it it has its it has its good points, and it has its uh, its less than good points, should we say? Anyway, let's see what uh, what the the parts are. Still quite a prevalent alcohol note. The finish is quite short. Yes, there's a little bit of spice, maybe a bit of honey, but it's all pretty, pretty simple stuff now. Pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, it's kind of oily. It's kind of yeah, it's kind of okay. Um, there's no real sort of <gasps> moment, you know, where you just go, "Wow, that's stunning." It's 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 an okay whiskey. You would say average, I suppose. Um, but I guess if, you know when you think of it that this is Klein Ellis, you just kind of expect maybe a little bit more. Um, and like I said, so I don't, I wouldn't necessarily call this a bad whiskey. It's just sort of, it's average. Right, okay, time to tackle the Glen Roth here, so let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? You expect me to say something horrible about this, but actually this is quite pleasant. Um, there's no fustiness, uh, there's no dirtiness, there's no sulphur. Um, what there is, is quite a pleasant citric character, there's lemon. Um, almost kind of gristy barley it's got a real minerality as well um lovely freshness uh, i mean you, are they terms you would normally associate with glen rothis because i certainly wouldn't so they must have found the barrel in a million that's all i can say um there's a touch of oak i mean you know balanced sitting in the background um i mean it's maybe not the most complex of whiskies on on the planet, but when you know what it is, you're going, ah, oh, you know. And and incidentally, when I did taste these originally and wrote my tasting notes and all that, obviously I didn't know what they were. I just had, um, well, I just had <laughs> all I had was just an ABV. Didn't even have a, a an age statement, uh, a region, or anything like that. All I had was uh, this was sample number fifteen, and the you know. That was it. That's all I had to work with. Um, and so, you know, you're kind of looking for markers to sort of, you know. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter where it came from um, because you, you're just working on the juice in the bottle. You know, that's it. That's all you've got to work with. And, and you write what you can taste. So um, had I known this was going wrong, this, I may well have given it an even higher score. But uh, um, like I said, it's, got, it's even got a... A slight kind of grassiness, and this is just like just so unlike Glen Rothers. It's just untrue. Um, mm, right, palette. Again, really quite pleasant. Um, no fust, no must, a bit more oak, um, but again we're not talking unbalanced, lovely citrus notes, a uh, touch of honey, barley, um, again like I said it's not the most complex of, of, of whiskies, but you know it delivers what it delivers really quite pleasantly, um, and just goes to show that, that back in the day Glen Rothes produced some lovely spirit. And since then, as we well know, like a lot of distilleries, it's all gone a bit downhill. Um, but so, wow, you know, I mean, that's, that's just really blown me away about, about you know, misconceptions. Well, no, they're not misconceptions at all. They're, 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 they're proper conceptions, I suppose, because I've tasted so much Glen Rothers of, uh, of recent... Um, or, you know, over the years, it has been sort of, you know, pretty much second-rate stuff. Uh, and, and then along comes something like this and you just go, oh my God, you know, I'm blown away by it. And like I say, it's not the most complex of whiskies on the planet and I imagine it was quite expensive being 23 years old. But uh, 
you know, if somebody had put you that, uh, you, you wouldn't have been too disappointed, it has to be said. Right, okay, so let's move on to the longbourn. Let's see what the nose gives us on this. So, uh, 20, 21 years old. That's a nice nose. Um, feels quite youthful, actually. I'd be, I wouldn't have pegged it for 21. Um, it's got that sort of pretty much classic long morny kind of carriage. Quite rich, quite dense. Um, a little balsamic, a touch of, of prune juice. Um, it's got more of a kind of a refill sherry kind of feeling. And certainly looking at the colour, um, you might think it was a refill sherry cask. But then obviously, as we know, you know, American oak can certainly uh, impart quite a serious amount of colour. Um, it's got a lovely oiliness, sort of, sort of lanolin, but not quite sort of its overt wool fatty. Um, it's, it's, it's some lovely earthy spices. There's a, a little musky note. Um, again, like I said, there's that balsamic fruit. Um, it's got a very, very kind of four square is the wrong word, but I think you'd probably. You can see what I'm getting at, very upright kind of, you know, Glen Granty kind of character to it. It's it's not particularly expansive, it's it's very sort of not tight, but you know, um very kind of hmm, you know. Um and that's a lovely nose, that really is a lovely whiskey. Um hmm. Let's see what the power's like. Soft, full, rich, a little grainy, um, again that's slightly balsamic dried fruits. Again, I would be in refill sherry territory here. I've got I'm getting a bit of dried fruit with that almost refilly kind of character, but um then it has that sort of almost kind of um grainy intensity. Um it's got some lovely malt, it's got some treacle, uh, a bit of spice on the finish. Um, yeah, yeah, they're slightly rye likey, uh, uh, I guess. Not more the kind of um, sort of spicy rye rather than the herbal rye. Um, so I'm guessing that that that, that is probably a, at least a, a sort of active American oak cask, probably a first fill. Um, there's a little bit of chocolate on the aftertaste. The malt kind of lingers right the way through. It kind of sort of sets out its stall to give you that rich, dense, malty character, which just sort of carries on, um, you know, for the, the, the entire duration uh, of the palate. And um, mm, that is really good, really impressive. That's a sort of uh, you know um, a, a sherry monster substitute if you fancy something big and rich uh, after dinner. And I I really like that. I think that's that's really impressive. And I think Longbourn is one of those distilleries that a lot of people yeah to a certain extent underrate because you just don't see it very often. Um, and um, you know I, I find more often than not that Longbourn certainly certainly delivers the goods and. and that bottling certainly did. Remember days, remember right, okay, so let's move on to the Glen Grant. Let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Now that smells an awful lot older than 22. Um, it's really mature. It's got oxidised fruit, tobacco, herbal spices, violets dusty almost dusty american oak it's starting to sort of get to that kind of slight dustiness um oh, lovely spice notes it's it really has got a lovely spiciness a touch of herbal notes coming through now and almost almost a kind of almost kind of fishiness um but not quite you know sort of getting to that point um there's a little bit of wood smoke in the background. Maybe 
Almost, yeah, is there is an almost petered note, and if memory serves me correct, I think Glenn Grant certainly back in the day um, used a relative amount of peat. So I think I'm fairly certain by about 1992 they'd kind of phased out that, but you know, obviously maybe they'd, they'd just done a peat, a sort of you know, moderately petered run, possibly. Um, as a, as a sort of a throwback exercise, I don't know. Um, because it's got that, it has that real earthy pungency, um, and like I said, an almost kind of fishy um, peatiness to it as well. Um, touch of waxy orange as well. I mean, that is just a stunning nose, absolutely stunning. Um, it has the sort of nose that you could just sniff all day. It really is absolutely gorgeous. So the pass on. Rich, dense, chewy, malty. Again, a slight peatiness, earth, um, oxidised fruit, a bit of drying tannin right on the finish, um, but there's still there's plenty of juice, juicy fruit, um, juicy mature fruit to sort of offset that. Um, it's a little raw maybe on the finish, um, but you know, it's, you know, I don't mind that to be, to be fair. I mean... Um, kind of sort of wakes you up at the end. It's it's not a kind of sort of like mm, it has a bit of a bit of liveliness in the finish, I suppose. Um, I'll stick a little drop of water with it. I don't really think it actually needed it because the um, um, the alcohol was pretty much well contained. But I just want to see whether it kind of does something with that the finish. Um, yeah, it's not really done the nose a huge amount of favours, to be honest with you. It's, it's maybe brought out a little bit more of the dusty oak and a bit more um, a bit more violet and maybe some sweeter barley notes. Um, it's sort of taken away some of that sort of uh, robust, rich character. So it passes like that. Yeah, it has lengthened it a little bit. It has kind of robbed it again, like the nose, of a little bit of its of its body and robust character. Um, I'm definitely getting Pete on the finish. Um, it certainly has brought that element out, uh, but it has made it a little simpler. And like I said, when I toasted the, I really don't think it needed water. Um, and I think really the only thing that water has done to it is just kind of lengthened the finish just a little bit, although it's still a bit dry um, and just a, a smidge raw. Uh, but either way, I mean, I, I for the nose alone, that's that's worth the entry price as far as I'm concerned. That is that is a lovely old grain grass. This tragedy you right. Okay. So let's. Uh, Finish with a bit of Tobermory then, shall we? Oak. Um, you know what? I mean, I was in First Fill American Oak. It's got that grittiness. Uh, it's herbal. It's dense. But then you kind of get a little bit of, of oxidised dried fruit. A little bit of tangerine either way it is it's it's an it's an oak monster um there's some rum like almost molasses character i mean i'm not getting any distillery character which you could which i suppose you could argue is not <laughs> not 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 a bad point um but it it, it is you know it's treading that kind of path between, you know, uh, bourbon and sherry character and, and 
Um, certainly when looking at the tasting notes that I wrote when I tasted it for the first time, I was convinced that we were we were sort of, you know, first filled bourbon. Um, because it's not, like I say, it's not got that sort of luscious, creamy, vanilla kind of character. It's got that sort of real dark, bourbony, rye sort of kind of character. Um, and then you've got the dried fruits and a little bit of prune and all that kind of stuff. And you're sort of going, what the hell cask is this? Is this some kind of weird hybrid kind of thing, you know? Um, but it's very clean. No sulphur. Uh, no blemishes. No necessarily character, but, you know. Um, and it's it's got quite a bit of maturity. It's got that sort of almost slight armagnac -y kind of character happening. Um, so, you know, I suppose you could argue that this is actually not a bad bottling. Um, anyway, let's see what the power's like. Again, the palate treads that same path that the nose did between, you know, real intense dark bourbony kind of character and dried fruit sherry, um, which really does mess with your head, it has to be said. Um, again, really robust, um, treacly, sort of raisinated, little bit of burnt wood, uh, tannins, quite a lot of tannin on the finish. Uh, again, no distillery character, but again, like, like I said, probably that's maybe not such a bad thing. It's it's clean, there's no sulphur, there's no fuss, there's no must, there's no... Um, again, it's got that sort of very armagnac kind of, of character on the aftertaste, you know, that sort of oxidised sort of apple and, and um, edginess, uh, but, you know, all really nicely contained. So, again, whoops, um, it's... You, know, you can argue that it's not a bad bottling at all. Um, although, you know, like I said, you're not getting any distillery character. Let's see what a little drop of water does. It's probably brought out a little bit more of an edge. We're now sort of getting slightly towards a sort of a sort of a sulphury kind of note, but we're not quite sulphury, if you can follow my uh, my line of reasoning here. Um, It's a bit less intense, it's a little bit sort of, you know, um, again, I don't really think it needed water to aid the nose. And although it's not sort of, you know, made it worse or sort of, it's not fallen apart, um, I don't think it really needed it. So anyway, let's see what the power's on now. Still a bit dry on the finish, but a bit longer. Certainly the palette now has a lot more sherry character. Um, sort of dark treacle and um, sort of drying, sort of oloroso -y tannins, a little bit of a herbal note as well. Um, again, I think sort of like, you know, if you like a bit of a, an oak monster, sherry monster, that kind of thing, it's, it's certainly not a bad whiskey. Um, and I will say I've had worse worse sherry matured whiskies than this. Um, so I suppose from from a kind of technical point of view, it's a pretty damn good Tobermory. To me, obviously, it's you know maybe a bit too much too much oak and not 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 enough trousers. But um, on the whole, I I what did I give that? Did I give that an eight point five uh, when um, when I originally reviewed it and. Um, yeah, I, I think I would stick with that. I, I honestly think uh, it's not a bad whiskey at all. It's only a matter of time stop right, okay, so let's sum today's episode of the show up. Well, Klein Ellis I thought was really quite disappointing. Um, you know, 
you kind of have high high hopes for certain distilleries when you when you taste their whiskies and when they don't really come up to sort of the level that you expect um i mean it wasn't bad it just just wasn't sort of you know overly endowed in the complexity stakes should we say um and then you have a Glen Rothers and you don't really expect an awful lot from it and then suddenly you get something like this and again like I said not hugely complex but oh you know that was actually very very nice and you know when again when you sort of then realize what distillery it comes from you're going you know and uh, and this is the wonderful thing about the independent bottlings you know you will get these oddities uh you know sometimes the oddities are good as in this case and sometimes the oddities are not quite so good but you know it's it's interesting um the long morn yeah i thought the long morn was absolutely gorgeous it was just spot on long morn as far as i was concerned sort of really dense really malty um and just it had a lovely all-round character and likewise the Glen Grant. I mean, yeah, all right, maybe a little bit more oak than uh, than some Glen Grants. Um, and but you yeah, know, I I thought that was that was a, a perfectly good whiskey, really quite enjoyable. Um, and the Tobermory. Well, again, I I think the quality of that was pretty good. I mean, it was a good cask. There was you know no off notes, no no you know it was very clean. I mean, yes, you could argue there was not a great deal of distillery character, but, um, you know, I think from from uh, that perspective, I think as if you're just tasting it, I didn't think it was a bad whiskey at all. So, um, you know, but in, in summing up, I, I would say that of the five whiskies, four of them were, well, probably two of them were, were exceptionally good. Um, and uh, two were okay, I guess, and one was was disappointing. So, so uh, not a bad hit rate, I suppose. And if that is the gen the, the rough hit rate of uh, of single malts of Scotland, and I must admit that I haven't tasted a huge amount of their their bottlings, then you know they're they're pretty much on a par, I guess, with with every other independent. So, um, so yeah, there you have it. That's this week's episode of the show in the bag. I, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, something a little bit different and um well i've got an awful lot to choose from for next week's episode of the show so uh until then good dramming and good afternoon <laughs>